Hello and welcome back to Let's Code Physics. Today we're beginning to create our code that will hopefully find the aphelion and perihelion of a planet's orbit around the sun or an object's orbit around the earth or you know any one thing's orbit around another thing out in space. I know that sounds vague but uh, you know we call it the universal law of gravitation because it applies to everything. So the way uh, that an orbital potential energy looks is that when you consider just the in and out motion, meaning the motion of the object toward the sun or away from the sun, uh, it has an effective potential energy that looks like this red curve here. There's the, uh, there's the outer part that is attractive, meaning it's going to make the planet tend to roll inward toward the sun, but then as it gets closer, when conservation of angular momentum kicks in, there's a repulsive term that pushes it away from the sun. Now this seems counterintuitive because we always think of gravity as attractive, and gravity is always attractive, but this is the result of conservation of angular momentum coming in. And so what it means is that whatever the total amount of energy that a planet has, and that's represented by the green line here in this graph, Whatever total amount of energy the uh, the planet has, it's got a limited range of R values that it can take on. So we can only take an R value uh, inside here where the red is beneath the green line. And so the idea is that out here is its furthest point, excuse me, farthest point. That's what we call the aphelion. And here is the closest point. That's what we call the perihelion. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out where this red graph intersects the uh, the green graph. And so what we're going to start today is a program that'll find those intersections for us. We're going to start by finding one at a time. Um, as always, we're going to start out with a clear command. Uh, now the technique we're going to use, uh, I described in the previous video, uh, basically you start out with a range that you are pretty sure contains the, uh, the intersection point that you're interested in. Let's just think about the aphelion here for at the beginning. So for example, I might start with a range of 1.5 to 2 because I can tell that it's, uh, that it's in between those. So what I would do is I would say r on the left equals 1.5 and r on the right equals 2.0. So that's going to be my initial guesses. Now of course I've got to tell the code what this um, what this red curve, what this what this potential energy function is that I'm interested in looking at, and I've got to tell it what this green line is, the constant value that I'm looking at. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put in the effective uh, potential energy. We're going to call that a function. Uh, so when we define a function in Scilab, it's just a it's just a second little piece of the code that the rest of the code is going to reference. Um, let's call that v effective since that's what we're dealing with. And that's of course going to be a function of r, the distance between the sun and the planet. So v effective, I actually want that to be v here. So v effective has two parts to it. It's got the repulsive term, that's the angular momentum squared uh, divided by two times the mass of the planet times its distance squared. So you notice this term is positive and so that means it's going to be the repulsive part out here on the left. And then we're going to subtract from that the attractive portion, the traditional um, uh, uh, gravitational potential energy. So here we've got the universal gravitation constant. Here we've got the mass of the sun. Here we've got the mass of the earth. And uh, let's see, this can get kind of complicated because these numbers are really, really big. And this number is really, really tiny. And that can cause a lot of problems for our... Uh, for our code. So we're going to work in sort of natural units for the problem. For distances, we're going to work in astronomical units. That's the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. For the mass of the Sun and, and the planet, we're going to use Earth masses. And so, and, and for time, we're going to be using years. So uh, give me just a second to cut out here, and I'm going to look up those values and then be right back. And here we are. So what I've done is I've looked up the values that we're going to use. So this is the mass of the planet. We're going to start out with Earth. So this is, uh, of course, one Earth mass. Duh. Um, the mass of the sun is 333,000 times uh, bigger than the mass of the Earth. So that's why we've got this number here. Uh, here's the gravitational constant in the appropriate units um, of AUs, years, and... 
uh, Earth masses. And so calculating the angular momentum of the Earth is actually pretty straightforward. It's the mass of the Earth times its uh, times its radius, excuse me, not the radius, but the distance between us and the Earth, that's of course one AU, squared times the orbital speed to pi divided by one year. Since we're, since we're in uh, units of AUs in years, our velocity around the Earth, excuse me, our velocity around the Sun is just two pi uh, AUs per year, or two pi times AU per year, yeah. Um, and so all of those values are going to be present here in this function. And so this function is going to be able to evaluate, uh, is going to be able to evaluate those. Um, and now, of course, I have messed things up because that is not what I graphed in here. So actually, how about we leave all of that for, oh, goodness gracious. Go away, reminders. Um, so how about we... And so actually, I have made a slight mistake for our test case. Um, actually, let's, let's do it this way, because I want to have a simple test case where I can graph the thing and figure it out. So let's do this. Let's uh, comment out all of these. And let's just make everything on their ones. That way we end up with this nice, simple function that we plotted here. So we're just going to make everybody one. You get a one. And you get a one, and you get a one, you're all getting ones. There we go. So now this thing will just be one over two r squared minus one over r. Perfect. So we know that the uh, we know that the aphelion is going to be between somewhere between 1.5 and 2. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a loop because we want the computer to keep cutting uh, this region in half and cutting it in half until we get to within a certain amount. So we're going to set up a tolerance value. We're going to call that, oh, uh, let's make it relatively big to begin with. Let's just go with 10 to the minus 3. And so we're going to say while the difference between our right and our left is less than the tolerance. Now I want this to be able to scale, so I'm going to use the percent difference. So we're going to take the average of our right and our left and Technically, since it's the average, I need to put in a two there. I don't know that it matters all that much. Uh, it's really only going to give you, you know, an extra iteration of the code, probably. Um, so while these two have a, oops, have a large difference, not a small difference. While they have a large difference, here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate whether the uh, we're looking for the pair, we're looking for the aphelion first. Evaluate whether the aphelion is is uh, in between the, or is in the, let's start with the left, is in the left half of the region, okay? What that means is we're gonna take a look at the, so like for example, if, if 1.5 to 2 is our region, we're gonna cut the region in half and we're gonna evaluate the left region, I meaning we're gonna evaluate the leftmost point and this midpoint to see whether uh, whether it has crossed the uh, the other side, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to figure out whether they have the same sign. The way we're going to do that is we're going to say if uh, the effective of our left, and we need to be subtracting off the energy level, and I forgot to specify the energy level up here. So let's say energy uh, here. We're looking at negative 0.4. So if uh, V effective minus E. So I want to look at the sign of this thing. I want to see whether it has the same sign on both sides. We're going to look at V effective of R in the middle minus E. Oops, I forgot some parentheses. Uh, I like Scilab's auto parentheses about half the time, meaning whenever I remember that it's going to, meaning whenever I remember uh, that I needed parentheses somewhere. Uh, so we also need to find an R mid, and that's going to be um, the average between R left and R right, divided by 2.0. Um, and actually, I can make this a little bit cleaner by go ahead and going, go ahead, and, oh gee, going ahead and calculating V left is V effective of R left, V right is V effective of R right, 
R the pirates do be like in this code and V mid equals V effective of R mid and that way uh, it only has to calculate those things once each instead of over and over again so let's call this guy V left and let's call this one V mid there we go so if those two have the same sign then their product is going to be positive if they have the same sign like for example here 1.5 to the midpoint to 1.75. Oh gosh, that's actually kind of close, but it's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit here. How about, uh, can I zoom in there? Perfect, okay. So if I wanna go between 1.5 and two, the midpoint is gonna be 1.75, which on the zoomed in version is pretty clearly uh, still on the left side of the perihelion. So that means those two are gonna be on the left side, excuse me, those two are gonna be on the same side, which means this product is gonna be positive because they'll both be negative. And then what we want is we wanna update V left. We wanna change our left, uh, replace it with the R mid value. We wanna replace V, uh, I guess it doesn't make much difference to replace the V left if we're, um, just, if we're just calculating them here. Um, no, actually in terms of efficiency, I could do that and then take these folks and put those outside the loop. There we go, that's cool. And so now what I'm gonna do is, so now what I'm gonna do, I've, I've, I've treated this case, otherwise, meaning else, the other thing needs to happen. I need to, op, I need to modify the value of our right. So one of them is always gonna stay the same, one of them is gonna change into the mid value, and then we're basically gonna say, forget about the other half of the region, and there's, hey Ed, there's end, okay? And so then the loop is just going to repeat itself. It's gonna continue going until we reach an acceptable tolerance value. Uh, so let's, uh, or an acceptable difference between the two. We've already set the tolerance value. And I think that's all we need to do. We're updating left or right, but never both. And then we come back over here and our mid is equal to this. V mid is equal to this. And of course, it doesn't do us any good without displaying it. So uh, let's have it uh, make one more calculation of our mid. And just to double check it, we'll have it calculate V mid again. It's already done the work. It may as well give us the answer. So we're gonna have it display. Uh, actually, let's let's do, the, do a little bit fancier than that. I was reminded lately of how to do MF printf. What this does is it lets you print stuff to the screen. So you put in a six to tell it to print to screen because six and screen both start with S. That's the reason I give myself for that being the case. And we are going to say that this is the, this is the aphelion and we'll give it as a percent float uh, for now. Aphelion and energy value because that should be the zero point, excuse me, the negative point four that we specified earlier. And so we're gonna ask it for R mid and V mid. And so this thing will work if, or we'll know this thing has worked if we get from the graph about a 1.8 and a negative point four. So uh, to quote Drew Carey, Alakazam. All right, our aphelion was 1.8, about what we expected. And our energy value was negative 0 0.4. basically uh, So we have successfully implemented a root finder here. And what we're going to do next time is we're going to uh, modify it to calculate the perihelion. And then we're going to put in the Earth's values, see if we can get it to calculate both the aphelion and the perihelion for us. So thanks very much for watching.